Hi guys, welcome to the Lloyd's Dead. Today we are seeding. Yeah, we are. <laughs> And thanks for hanging with me today. I am filming this intro in um, towards the end of March. And a lot of the footage you're going to be seeing is middle of February. <laughs> so sorry. I am just shoving all of my seed tray videos that I had recorded over the past month into one. And that's what you're about to see. So yeah. Come hang with me while I seed a whole bunch of stuff over the past month. And then at the end, I will show you guys what they look like now that we are officially in spring. Cool? Cool. Hi, friends. <laughs> Welcome back to the Lloyd's Stead. Today, I am going to start some seeds. Not a ton, because we're still 10 to 11 weeks out from our average last frost date. Uh, so... This is still a little early <laughs> to start a lot of stuff, but I'm jonesing to get my hands in the dirt. It is freaking 55 outside, even though it is February. So that makes me just want to do the things. Um, but everything that I'm starting now can be started early, has a certain level of frost tolerance, and I am starting them in my greenhouse where I've got a little tiny baby 200 watt heater um, that can knock the chill off of these guys should it get really cold. So that's what we're doing. And I'm a little bit disorganized because, because <laughs> that's just how I do. Y'all, that's how I do. So what I want to do first is I've got um, my seed starting mix right here that is super dry because it's been hanging out in the greenhouse. And for those of you who might not know or might not be familiar, Soil and, and soil-less mixes like this often have kind of hydrophobic properties when they get overly dry. That means they don't like water. So I'm first gonna dump some water in here and moisten that up and let it sit while I get everything else set up. Are y'all feeling left out? Here, come here, come on, come on. Let's go look at the dirt together, shall we? There it is. There's the dirt. We're going to let that soak in the water while I get the trays ready. Cool? Cool. Let me set you guys back down here. Just, just sit tight there for a second. Good? Good? Feeling good? Are you guys cozy? Probably. You're probably very warm sitting there. It is, let's see, I actually came out with the sweater because it is mid 50s outside. So it's about sweater weather. And here it is, 80, 80 degrees. That's warm, y'all. All right, you set this aside. I'm gonna plug in my heating mats and then show you what we're planting. All right, you guys, I don't even know if you guys can see what I'm doing here. Let me tell you guys down. Huh? Oh, hello, windy wind. These are my heat starting mats, um, or my, <laughs> excuse me, my seed starting mats. These honestly have been a little bit of a game changer for me. And I won't say that about many things. They are not expensive. Um, maybe whole, I don't even know, maybe 20 bucks for a mat, maybe 25 to 30 for a mat with a thermostat controller. Highly recommend the thermostat controller. You guys, without that, what these babies do is they simply warm up and they keep whatever is sitting on them about 10 degrees above ambient. I mentioned earlier that it is about 80 degrees in here right now. If these little suckers are on, they're going to fry my seedlings. <laughs> so I have a temperature controller. I'll show you this, this funness. Um, I actually have, I plug a couple into one controller. So I didn't need to buy all my mats with controllers. I have one controller 
and two controllers and I actually have four mats so I can plug two or three into here and one or two into here and have different temperature zones. Fancy. Because, and I, I won't go too deep into it, but because some things, especially the stuff I'm starting now, does not want it to be that warm in order to germinate. Some stuff, like tomatoes and peppers that we will start later on, loves it that warm. So these guys, I'm gonna only keep about 60, maybe 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're gonna plug a couple mats into this one controller. So I just got a plug splitter and it does fine. It does mean that these mats are all gonna be linked to the same temperature probe. Just in case you're wondering about my power to my greenhouse, because it's a thing some people wonder about. I don't have a ton of power in the greenhouse. I'm sorry, that's probably obnoxiously loud, me moving stuff around. This is the only power I have in the greenhouse, which is why we don't heat this. We actually don't have any power running to it for most of the winter. This is a line that goes actually through my husband's, um, through Dave's hoop structure there to his shop building, which is right behind that structure. It goes in through a window. This is an outdoor rated coil and cord. So this is my power source. I do need to go turn it on in the shop though. Like I said, we turn it off during the winter, most of the winter. The other part of my seed set up here is I have them setting on foam. This just, I don't even remember where we got it. It's probably left over from some project. You don't necessarily want to set these on top of something metal. The foam does beautifully for me. You do want to make sure that it's, um, they're sitting on something that's not going to have standing water. These are rated to get wet, so that's cool. And like I was started to say earlier, I am all over the place, you guys. This one controller is controlled by this temperature probe. So as you'll see, I'm going to actually stick it in the soil of one of these mats. Um, these two mats, I'm actually just going to scooch aside. They will come in later on. Keeping seedlings consistently warm is one of the best ways to assure germination. It also, in a greenhouse out here that is pretty much unheated, that difference in temperature will keep them from freezing solid. This structure keeps most of the frost off of them. It is a really nice system for use in a greenhouse if you can just get a simple power source. So yeah, that's all that. Let me pull out the trays. Seed starting trays. I tend to recycle these a lot. And you see, I'm just going to admit it, I am not good at really scrubbing and disinfecting my seed starting trays, my seed starting materials from year to year. Do as I say, not as I do. I know it's important that you do it. I just, I'm so bad at it. I'm so bad at it. So here we are. We're going to be using seed trays that are not properly sanitized, but this is sufficient, I would think, for starting the seeds that I want to start. Let me get my mixture. All right. Here's my soil starting mixture. I'm actually going to take off my, this is my Sunday watch, tuck him in my pocket. All right. Now that this is nice and moist and, and I'm happy with it being this wet, I am actually going to do this. I'm all over the place. I'm going to remove him for a second so that I don't get a lot of soil down in there. And I'm going to simply fill my trays. This is going to take a moment. So just hang out. I'll put some music on for you. Just a quick tip while I'm doing this. I do want to make sure that I'm not trapping a lot of air bubbles 
down in there because water has a hard time wicking up through air. <laughs> That's not a thing. So I do press these down just to make sure that the soil is firm in there, not hard packed, but firm. That will also help with my seedling root development as well. So I'm gonna set this aside. Let me fill these trays and then we'll get going with the actual seeds. And again, guys, oh, you totally can't see what I'm seeing, what I'm doing. Let me move this. Again, I use my fingers to firm, but not pack the soil down into each of these blocks. All right, I'm gonna tuck these back in their, in their trays. Oh, look, look, he made a mess. That's why we're in a greenhouse. That's why it's good that these seed mats are rated for moisture. Let's talk about, let's talk about what we're doing. Here's where we're at. Here's my pile of seeds. I'm always fascinated by where people get their seeds and why. Um, this company, Swallowtail Garden Seeds, is new to me this year. So we're gonna see how those do. That's where some of these seeds are from. You will see a lot of my seeds ta -da, are from Johnny's unmatched in terms of the educational materials that they offer with their seeds. And frankly, the seeds are well-tested, the highest quality that I have gotten. You do pay a premium for that though. So that's what it is. Hudson Valley, I've got some seeds from Hudson Valley Seed lovely seeds but i don't know if, if any of you have seen their art packs that is why i buy hudson valley seeds because the art on their seed packets is Mwah. and no this is not the art of, um they have an interior seed packet that is inside of a beautiful little folded piece of art frankly high mowing seeds they are lovely they're from vermont they are all Organic non-GMO, um, a smallish company, and Baker Creek, also lovely, rareseeds.com. They, their catalogs are lovely. I think that's all I've got here. Oh, uh, no, good. Also, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. If you are on the East Coast, especially if you're in Virginia, because they are in Virginia, their seeds are born and raised. <laughs> in Virginia and so they are well suited for our climate. Okay, so those are the seed companies. Let me figure out where I'm putting them all and then I'll talk about what we're planning. And we're back. <laughs> My camera actually overheated because um, it's hot in here and it was in the sun and that was silly of me and I'm still learning all the things. So here's what we're gonna do. I am, um, Really quickly, just gonna show you what I'm planting and then I will do like, you know, super fast and I will plant them out and then I'll show you the final result. So today we are planting. Are you ready for this? We're gonna start <gasps> Biplurum, yay! Biplurum I um, grew for the first time last year and loved it. I will pop a picture somewhere, somewhere. Um, loved it for filler in my bouquets it actually does beautifully direct seeded and that's how i grew it last year um, so i will save a lot of these seeds for direct seeding in the early spring but i want to try a couple um, i want to try one row of these for planting out and seeing if that can help my um my succession planting with these because i did not successfully succession plant these and ran out and i was sad because they are a lovely filler. Sweet peas. These guys do not love getting root bound in any way as like is true of any peas. Um, so I actually do like to winter sow them as well in my containers, but I didn't have enough containers. So I'm gonna start some 
in here and then just be very cognizant about not letting them um, get root bound and I will transplant them into something larger as soon as they germinate. Viola, first year trying these dudes, watching um, a video from Johnny Seeds. They had um, a, a video of growing these four very early cut flowers. So these obviously violas or pansies as many people <laughs> call them do beautifully in cold weather. I figure even if they don't work out as cut flowers in bouquets, they will be lovely as little tiny arrangements in the spring and I can stick them in my beds um, and bring me joy. Anybody else find it fascinating that the word pansy is used for people who are like shy and weak and whatnot and they are some of the toughest little flowers there are so there's that i have three kinds of digitalis or foxglove i have last year i planted out a handful of them um because and they were the they were some of the biennial varieties which means the classic foxgloves. You plant one year and they grow for a year and then the following year they will set flower and go to seed. Um, so biennial. But Camelot cream, this one should apparently flower its first year. So we're going to try those guys. New to the whole foxgloves. Um, but they are also so 10 to 12 weeks before last frost. So we're there. Um, spinach. I want some spinach to put underneath my row covers and winter density romaine as well. Snapdragons. Mm. Um, these are the only snapdragons I've got to start right now. I will start more probably in a couple weeks. But these are um, Potomac early snapdragons. These are 8 to 12 or 8 to 10 weeks before your last frost. So I've got those pictures up on the screen somewhere. Yay me. Fever few. I have two varieties and I'm going to do six of each. Fever few is a short lived perennial for me here in zone six B. Um, they say short lived perennial, but I have actually had most of my fever few come back for a couple years now so i don't know how how long <laughs> they're perennial but um just last year was when i really started using fever few in bouquets and mm, love them they have this lovely they add this like kind of romantic cottagey air to um to my bouquets and arrangements so i just had this sort of classic species fever few from southern exposure um, that I've grown last year so these are actually older seeds hopefully they'll still germinate usually they do and then I'm trying this guy from Johnny's this is called magic lime green and I have not grown him um, I have high hopes high hopes and then Canterbury bells so Canterbury bells um, I should take you guys out and show you underneath the row covers in my garden um, I have one and a half beds that are covered right now that have some overwintered cool annual flowers and Canterbury bells are one of them that are actually growing very well underneath the row covers. It's my first time with them. Um, so I have not had a chance to use them in bouquets or anything, but they're, look at how pretty they are. So if they work, then I'll let you guys know. And we'll see but I wanted to plant some more out again to kind of get my succession going so I am going to go through this really fast I'm going to make sure I label things because your sister is really bad at labeling things these are my reused little little guys I need to go actually go get a marker because I forgot mine of course I did of course I did and then I'm going to go grab a marker. I'm going to label them da -da 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 -da, and then I'm going to plant them and then show you what I do then. So let's go.
Okay friends, here's what we're doing today. Here are the seeds that I am planning on putting in my cell packs. I have 12 rows because I do them in rows this way. So 12 rows of 12. There you go. And um, because each of these are, these are 72 pack trays, except they're 71 because they're super cheap and I lose the corners a lot. And every year I say I'm going to throw these away and not use them again, but then they're okay. And I use them because I don't want to buy more. Um, but I am transitioning to soil blocks more and more. However, there are some things that like more room and there are some things that like a little tighter moisture control and that's these dudes. So I've got, actually I have 11 things, but I am going to do two rows of the Bells of Ireland because I mm, grew those for the first time last year and loved them. So here's what we're doing. Let's take a quick tour. And I apologize for the audio quality. My mic died. Eh. Um, my camera's on its way too. All right, Cardinal Basil, ta-da! I'll put pictures up of these. These are what I'm starting. This is the only basil I'm starting right now because it's a little early, but I want to try in succession. So these, and they took a while in the season last year to really be beautiful, but they, I mean, look at those. It looks almost like hydrangea flowers. Oh my gosh. So beautiful in bouquets and lovely basil smell. Definitely a winner. Going to do that. Achillea, also known as yarrow. Those of you who are paying attention know that I also winter sowed some yarrow. Um, and just spoilers, I'm going to start some in seed blocks as well. I don't feel like I could have enough after realizing how beautifully it dries and how um, well it attracts pollinators and things. Love me some yarrow. Roselle, Thai red, also called false roselle. Um, I think it's also called false roselle. Grew these for the first time last year after trying for a couple years in a row. Beautiful, like giant. They grew in one season to about four foot by four foot bushes that were just stunning and did not do well for cut flower production at all. Um, but the hibiscus like flowers were very tropical and lovely in the landscape. And, um, this is the hibiscus that people grow for those calyxes, which I'll pop another picture up somewhere. Editing Becky, get on it. Um, this actually, this has, this seed packet, I've got two seed packets, has a picture, um, of the calyxes. So once it has flowered, it forms these calyxes that are, juicy red loveliness that tastes like almost like raspberries and you make this beautiful you can make tea out of it you can candy the calyxes and put them in in like fizzy drinks and they're so pretty um so yeah i made a hibiscus ginger syrup oh my gosh i'll be singing these praises a lot more throughout the season but i'm starting those now We've got Jewels of Opar, another one that I just grew this past year, um, just in case you haven't picked up on it already. This is only really my third year growing cut flowers in any volume. Um, so many of these are still new to me, but I'm expecting that where I had them last year, some have self-seeded because apparently that's a thing they do very easily. These were stunning in arrangements and I loved them and didn't have enough. So I'm gonna start some. Cranberry hibiscus. Also known, um, this is super similar to like Johnny's mahogany splendor. Big, beautiful mahogany leaves that were spectacular for cut flowers. Once I figured out the secret, <laughs> which was you don't cut these until they're nice and mature. You don't cut the leaves or you don't cut the stems until the stems have gotten really woody. Otherwise they wilt very easily. I was disappointed at the beginning of the year, beginning of the season, cause I started cutting them too early and then I figured it out. Yay. So I also did not have enough of these. They're beautiful in the landscape and awesome for cut flowers, which is a theme you'll be picking up on. I, um, will show you around more as we get into the season, 
but I have what I call my productive garden, which is where a lot of these will go. That's more kind of traditional raised beds, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of these I put in my landscape to enjoy. And the cranberry hibiscus is absolutely one of those that I highly recommend for in the landscape because it gets so big so quickly, but it's an annual, so there's no commitment. And it was like that mahogany color. Mm, so good. Okay. <clears throat> Where was I? Tokyo long white bunching onion. Yay! Spring onions won't get big bulbs, but perfect for just cutting and snipping in salads and stir fries, etc. Candy onions. Candy onions are what we call intermediate onions. They're not long day, they're not short day. They're perfect for zone six, which is where I'm at. So we're gonna give these a try. I was not super successful getting big bulbs of these last year, but I did get decent sized bulbs and they were all delicious. So I'm starting them um, probably not even early enough, but I'm starting them hopefully early enough that I'll get some decent sized bulbs. <clears throat> Calabrese broccoli. These are also a couple years old, so I'm going to be like multi seeding these. Calabrese, these um, make pretty little heads, like relatively small heads, but then once you cut off the main head, you get lots of little side heads, lots of little side shoots that are lovely in their own right. So this is a good broccoli. Bells of Ireland. As I said, this is the one that I'm actually going to see two rows in. I'm going to see 24 plants of this because I did not have enough last year. Last year was my first successful year growing it and oh my dang y'all, oh my dang. I love these so much. Any that I don't, any seeds that are left over from putting in the seed trays, if I have any, we'll see. I am going to direct sow because that's actually how I grew all of mine last year. They were all direct sowed and mm, love these for bouquets and for just in the garden. They're stunning. Green mist laced lace flower. This is another Ami. I've got Ami Dara in the garden right now overwintered. Um, and I've got some Ami that I'm also going to seed in um, some Ami Dara that I'm also going to seed in soil blocks. I've not tried this one Though this one apparently is pale green-ish, which has to go with everything, right? Dara is a burgundy, um, and I couldn't get enough of that last year in bouquets and arrangements. So we're trying this. Nice flower. And then, last but not least, money plant. Lunaria, which I believe in the UK people call um, honesty. And this is going to be for my dried flowers almost exclusively. I am going to sow this um, or I'm going to plant this in my shade garden because this will tolerate a good bit of shade. Apparently I have never grown it. It will also self seed like crazy, which worries me a little bit, but my shade garden is a, is wild <laughs> and free anyway. So, so that doesn't worry me over much. And if I've got just, buckets and bucketfuls for making wreaths out of then so be it so we're gonna try him okay so I'm gonna stick these in the trays I'm gonna label them then I'll show you what's what and then I'm gonna go in and have some coffee okay <laughs> My other camera died. Hmm. So I'm on my phone for a quick second. Hopefully y'all will forgive bad audio or video or whatnot. <laughs> um, but I wanted to show you what I did. Here we are. Um, 
here's all sewed as you saw at the end of the time lapse i like to sprinkle vermiculite over the top of my seeds even the ones that say they need light to germinate because um, I find that vermiculite doesn't block a ton of light, but it does help control the growth of algae. It does help control the moisture. So, so far that hasn't been a problem and I will continue to use it. If you disagree, let me know gently. My heart is tender. Again, I apologize that right here at the end, the audio and video probably got a little lower quality. I promise I'm gonna make it up to you guys as I figure out what I'm doing. So yeah, keep on keeping on. <laughs> so you guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned some stuff. I hope you um, maybe were inspired, which is my whole hope and prayer for a lot of these videos. I'm going to show you what many of these seeds look like. Seedlings at this point look like now that it's been more than a month for many of them um, and we're still a couple weeks out of our average last frost date so these guys still have a while to grow in here but let's see what's happening all right you guys didn't see me do these but these are a thing I did <laughs> I got some some white mignonette which I'm excited about these are some cranberry hibiscus some poppies they're all looking good you guys did watch me do these guys. The species fever few is coming up like a dream. I overseeded because the, the seeds were old and I wasn't sure what kind of germination I'd get. Apparently very good germination. But even the magic lime has done pretty well. I have germination in all those. The Camelot cream foxglove looks awesome. The cafe cream, not so much. But the Dalmatian peach, we got Potomac early snapdragons, we got some viola. I didn't get total germination on that. You guys didn't see this. These are actually snapdragons that I pricked out from the farm. So those look good. I'm gonna skip right over those because those are a different video. These I just seeded just a couple days ago. These you guys saw. We have not so good germination on the candy onions which I kind of expected. Onion seeds don't have a lot of viability after a while, and these are old seeds. Tokyo bunching onion looks good. Calabrese broccoli is another one that was a really old seed, so I'm excited that I have a couple. Cardinal basil, yarrow, another kind of foxglove. <laughs> Bells of Ireland, crappy germination, which makes me sad, but I think I mentioned earlier in the video, I had much better luck direct seeding the Bells of Ireland last year and it looks like I've got the same situation. Can we just appreciate this happening outside? That's our new our new homestead cat. <laughs> she has has adopted us so yeah I might do a short about her. There she is so that's fun. Okay lace flower that looks good. Jewels of Opar looks awesome. Cranberry hibiscus there and Roselle red tie. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty stoked about most of these. A little disappointed with some of the germination, but that's how it goes. Just to share with you guys what I do with the seedlings at this point. Once they've once they've germinated, I actually take a bunch of them off of the seed mats unless they are a heat-loving crop or a flower. But things like snapdragons don't need to be on the heat mat anymore. Things like sweet peas don't need to be on the heat mat anymore. Long story short, the heat mats are good for germination, but the babies don't need to hang out on them. But I also, once they've germinated, this is what I use. Duh. Neptune's Harvest. I started using that a couple years ago um, because it was recommended to me by my farmer, my farmer aunt and it's a really great all-purpose fertilizer. I'm trying this year the rose and flower fertilizer by them and the veg and tomato fertilizer instead of just an all-purpose fertilizer. But while they're seedlings, I just put a tiny bit, it doesn't take much, a tablespoon per gallon. 
put a tiny bit of that in my watering can and that's what I water the seedlings with once they've germinated. Full disclosure though, it does make the greenhouse not smell the best. It's fish and seaweed emulsion. So it's definitely like not pleasant. <laughs> so anyway, again, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with me while I seeded over the past month. I am working on uploading a video of my seed blocking because that's a, it's just a whole different ball game. I do both. Obviously, I, I feel like both of them have a place. So yeah, drop a note below, say hi, like, subscribe, but definitely come back and join in on this journey with us. We'll see you guys later at the Lloydstead. Y'all can't hear that, I know. I have chickens making funny noises. That's kind of how they do though, isn't it?